We're starting a little early here, getting our foot in the door before we start officially at, oh man, look at this. There we go. Before we start officially on the top of the hour, got a lot of stuff to cover here today. Uh, we're going to go over the best precision rifle products that I reviewed on 2018. Now, there's a lot of stuff out there in the market. There's a lot of stuff in the universe. And um, I try to get a hold of the best stuff I can in constant search of those products that I think are the shiznit, as they say. Is that what they say nowadays? I'm looking at the wife. She's not paying any attention to me. <laughs> Anyhow, so how are you guys doing tonight? Uh, happy new calendar day as of the other day there. I hear it's a new calendar for the Gregorian type folks out there. Hey, from Lubbock, Texas, right on. How you doing? We got Larry on the web here. Oh man, we got a few folks. We got Marco. No, that's not Marco Rubio. Oh, it's Grand Illusion. <laughs> They're having conversations already. They're out of control. So we're going to be covering all kinds of stuff here today. Um, we'll give you the basic rundown real quick, and then we'll start again as we get started here in about 15 minutes or 12 minutes or so. What I'm going to cover tonight is going to be the best precision rifle component innovation, in my opinion, for this last year that I've seen. Now, again, mind you, there's a lot of stuff out there, of course, that I have not seen, but uh, the best one that I could find. Uh, the best custom rifle spared no expense so if you need like a custom rifle put together um, i found the best one in my opinion that i could find the best factory rifle um, and the best budget rifle build we're going to go over all those deals for a hit every category custom rifle factory rifle and a budget rifle uh, the first two being spared no expense we're also going to talk about the best value in a new precision tactical rifle optic that's one that you're going to be indexing up and down first focal plane configuration typically mil mil uh, we're going to talk about the best value i could find in a precision hunting optic okay now that's going to be a different configuration just in terms of our definitions here uh, a lot of uh, sportsmen here in the united states still like to run the second focal plane um, minute of angle configuration so we're going to talk about those i found a pretty nice one there and then we're going to talk about the best value in new carbine uh, slash combat optics, okay? For like DMR applications, because that's a whole different, different ball game there. Then we're going to talk about uh, the best value in a tactical spotting scope and also the best tactical spotting scope, I think, that still exists on the market. And then we're going to talk about the best ELR specific product reviewed in 2018. Uh, so like specialized peripheral equipment. Uh, for ELR particularly, and we're going to talk about the best in peripheral equipment innovation um, for the year of 2018 Then I've got a chance to review. We'll talk about the best ballistic solvers for 2018, the best laser rangefinder, um, the best books specific to like uh, combat applications, long range shooting, tactical applications, and then we're going to talk about the best in precision rifle related online training courses because those do exist and then we're going to talk about the best value in commercial firearms training in general that i've experienced this year and uh we'll talk about all these things in detail and then of course uh last but not least the best rex defense course we had in 2018 because we had a lot of fun in 2018 particularly with one course that i had a lot of fun with not to say i don't have fun in all of them which i i very much do um but uh there was one that was particularly fun i thought and we'll talk about that so that's something we're going to go over today how are you cats doing today i suppose it is uh shabbat right the sun went down and it's uh break time now right so happy uh friday night for you guys and uh we're just sitting here chilling uh, i was able to put this list together in the last couple hours i thought man i should do a lot of the other like really organized YouTube guys that are really smart do these end of the year wrap up kind of deals, just kind of covering all the different stuff they've seen. Mr. Guns and Gear uh, usually does that. Uh, I think that's a pretty cool tradition to start. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be a copycat and copy Mr. Guns and Gear and uh, and do that same deal. <laughs> so yeah, I'm excited, man, to go over this. Uh, I've been off the radar for a little while, working on lots of projects, lots of testing and evaluation, putting together um, a new website for rexdefense.com, which is still kind of in the works. 
We're still working out the bugs and stuff like that. So it's currently under construction. So if you find stuff on there that's crazy or not quite right yet, we're working on it. But uh, we're, we're a small operation at this time and we're just having fun putting it together. I'm excited about how it's set up. It should, you know, the, the training schedule got somewhat complex this year and uh, the old website was kind of um, limited in its uh, flexibility. And so we did kind of change over and we got a real good outfit tier one marketing solutions to give us a hand with that. And uh, they've been doing a good job helping me out with the infinite patience, uh, get me squared away on the computer land stuff because as much as you guys might see me on computer land, that's actually not my forte. Those of you that know me know that's kind of true. <laughs> I know how to edit videos. I'm an artist. I'm a graphic design artist and all that stuff, man. But I just like, it's not my favorite thing to do is sit there and play on the computer all day because it drives me crazy. But some guys really have a good talent in that, and so I like to delegate that expertise out there. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, at the end of the list, and after, let me see how many things we got on the list. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 items on the list. After we're done with the list... If we got enough time and we got enough battery, I'll be sticking around, man, and we can do a questions and answers after that for you guys to fill in the cracks. Now, until we get to that point, when I'm on the mode of looking at this stuff and, and when I'm on task, I got tunnel vision. So I might not see your commentary. So if you say something really awesome in the commentaries and I don't see it, I apologize. But when we do get to question and answers mode, I will definitely look at the commentaries. And uh, we should be, I think we had it scheduled for top of the hour, right, guys? Like uh, 8 Central Time, which would be, what would that be, 9 Eastern Time or whatever? And uh, so on and so forth. So we'll just hang out for a little bit uh, here and, and let the rest of the cats roll in real quick. Uh, let's see what we got in the commentaries here, a little pre-video Q&A or com commentaries. All right. Anyone selling a CZ Scorpion Evo? Hmm. Actually, I got one of them. Them are really cool. The CZ Scorpion might be my favorite little uh, carbine that they make, or the, not a carbine, but a little subgun kind of deal. A little 9mm. Really, really nicely made, actually. You know, the, the Czechs in this uh, Republic, the Czech, uh, the Czech Republic and, the, and, the, and the Slovakia and those countries over there have really good metallurgy and got a real good history of machining. Um, and they do a good job with their, with their manufacturing of firearms. I had that Grand Power. I think that's made in Slovakia, a uh, 9mm review like a year or two ago, and that thing is, uh, for being cheap, honestly, if you look at the heat treatment, the polishing, the machining of the metals as an engineer, and it's got kind of a, a, a rotating barrel setup, a, ro a rotating lock, uh, very, very nice pistol, man, so, and same thing with CZ, CZ Cheska Zebroska has always done a very good job in terms of their quality, and the nice thing about Eastern European products is that they're still like uh, affordable. Um, they got uh, good affordable stuff that you can buy. And that goes with optics or all kinds of different stuff. So a lot of the stuff out of the East, Eastern European area, as long as you're still in Europe proper, does a pretty darn good job providing uh, good value in general, in my opinion. All right, we got a lot of cats on here now, or I think we're ready to roll pretty soon, man. We got like uh, five minutes left and we can start reading the list. So I don't know uh, what you guys, uh, anyone get any cool toys over the Festivus season here in the last couple weeks? You guys got anything kind of fancy or what? <laughs> I'm waiting, everyone paused. <laughs> I got a lot of uh, neat stuff throughout the year. Previous to that, oh, someone got a 308 RPR for, for uh, Christmas there. The Ruger Precision Rifles are very popular, and they're actually a pretty good value. I've seen a lot of them at the classes. I'd say, man, I don't want to guess, but I'd say 30% of the rifles at the, at the classes we do, or maybe 25%, are RPRs. And uh, they're actually a good shooting rifle. Most of those guys have no problem with them. And so um, there's a few things you have to manage on them because there's a lot of ergonomic uh, flexibility on them. And anytime you have a stock with that much adjustability, there's a lot of stuff to keep a, a track of. But for the most part, if you keep that butt stock tight and everything and you run good ammo in there, 
Uh, you're subbing that gun very easily, and uh, even without really trying that hard. And if you get everything dialed in right, I mean, and tighten up right, you can almost get them to touch at 100 yards. They're a nice shooting rifle. Not a bad. And Ruger, I've always liked the company, Ruger in general, uh, just in terms of innovation and uh, their pulse on the American market in terms of like what would be cool to invent. Stuff that, you know, they always come out with neat ideas that are sort of outside the box. And uh, I've, I've long been kind of a fan of Ruger in general. Um, but I got a lot of different Rugers laying around, I guess. But uh, yeah, the RPRs, that I don't have one yet, but I've shot a lot of them. And I've seen hundreds of them come through the courses. And they always do pretty darn good. And someone got a Tika T3 TAC A1 with an Athlon ETR scope. And that's pretty cool. Uh, the Tika, of course, is a really nice rifle. They're a good value. If you're looking for a good value rifle, they're very hard to beat over the counter. You just want a factory over the counter rifle that shoots awesome and you don't have to mess with it. Tika's in Savage and even Bergara. Uh, real, good, real good choices there. Uh, you don't have to do a whole lot to them. You just basically put ammo in them. <laughs> And it's all contingent, of course, on your marksmanship. That's 90% of the game, of course. Yeah, but you guys already know about that stuff, don't you? All right, we're getting close, man. We're like three minutes out. Then we're going to go live. No, we're live already, aren't we? Are we? No. We're already live. <laughs> I will be courteous to those who are, you know, I scheduled ahead of time, saying we'd be on at uh, the top of the hour, so i got to be nice. Someone got a, what, what are we talking about? Hey, Rex, I appreciate all you do. You have any experience with the 338 Edge? I'm looking at building one off a Remington Ultra Magnum. Thanks, man. Happy new calendar day. I have not really shot the Edges that much. I know they're very popular uh, for ELR shooting. It's a nice deal to do it. Now, if you're a reloader, and uh, a lot of guys really have a lot of fun. They get a lot of joy out of uh, creating new cartridges and Wildcats and and um, playing with brass. So if, if that's if you're a connoisseur of such uh, details, then I think the edge is not a bad way to go. Uh, you get a little bit more horsepower out of your cartridge. I think the La Pua Magnum in its normal form is more than adequate for most applications, but the edge might give you a little bit of an edge. Uh, actually, uh, I was having a conversation with a friend at uh, Axial Precision, and I think they got a 338 edge and kind of a super ultra lightweight deal which uh, has a good muzzle brake on it. So if anyone's looking for a big, heavy-hitting Super Magnum and a, a carryable rifle and something that's pretty affordable, maybe get in touch with them and see if you can snatch it up. Maybe. I don't know. You can call them and check. Oh, man, what else we got here? And I'm reading the commentaries. For those of you who are watching afterwards and don't know there's commentaries, you think the Schmidt and Bender PM2 is still the better scope as compared to Night Force and Vortex? Yeah. I do. That's just my personal opinion based on a huge amount of experience with all three. Um, <laughs> but no, I, the Schmidt and Bender is hard to beat in a lot of ways. Uh, they're really good. But there's trade-offs for anything, guys. Um, if you can't get a hold of it, then the Night Force is better, right? Because they have Night Force is not bad. And Vortex is like real nice uh, razor line. They're not bad either. Those, those scopes will all work good if you manage them properly. 90% of it's going to be in your ability to know what to look for to verify that the thing is working properly. So as important as optics are one of the general weak points in general in any long range system equipment wise. If you're talking about long range shooting equipment, optics is kind of one of them spots where guys maybe could have got a stronger, you know, deal there. On um, that being said, all three of those optics are more than adequate to get the job done, assuming they're working properly, right? And so that's something that if you know how to vet it and make sure everything's good, then you're set. So we'll take a couple more uh, commentaries and questions here, and then we'll move into the list, the list of actual things we're going to talk about. Aloha from Seattle. Yes, it is raining. <laughs> man, Seattle's awesome. I love it. I love the Pacific Northwest, man. That is so pretty. You got all that uh, fruit groves and flowers on the trees that are like this big. And uh, I went for a honeymoon up there one time, way back, a long time ago. <laughs> I'm getting old and crusty. Right, babe? Uh, okay. She's just smiling over here. <laughs> What's the best chronograph, in your opinion? Okay. Well, we can talk about that because that's not on the list. We'll talk about that. Uh, I think that if you know how to manage it properly, the, the lab radar is very hard to beat. It gives you very good readings. I think in terms of field expediency and setup, 
The V3 Magneto Speed is a really nicely configured chronograph. You just kind of put it on there and it's set up very uniform uh, every time. Now, <coughs> from what I understand, uh, Magneto Speed has uh, originally had really, really good quality control. And um, I'm not sure if they're keeping up to speed on that or not. I've heard different stories there. Uh, that's something that maybe would warrant a little bit of study. Um, but that being said, we use the V3 for most of our courses, and it'll give us data that when you line it up with uh, some of the good premier ballistic softwares like Dead On Balls Accurate, D O B A, DOBA. And so that's uh, it works fine. All right, guys, we are now at the top of the hour. I'm going to take a little sip here, and then we shall get started with our best of precision rifle products for 2018. And at least the ones that I got to see. And as you see here, I got my Rex. Oh, you can't see the Rex head on here. I don't know. There, hey, there's a dinosaur head on there. One of my beloved alumni have, has given that to me at a seminar, I believe in Pennsylvania. Good folk out there. I do look forward to visiting Pennsylvania again this year. I did get some stuff scheduled out there in PA for you guys in the Northeast. So stand by. All right, guys. We're going to go through the list now. Uh, and I read you, I'm going to read it one more time real quick. And I'm actually going to go through this backwards and save the best for last. So the, we're going to go into the best precision rifle component innovation. That's always a controversial topic, especially if guys don't pay attention to the title. Some guys got bent out of shape last year when I was talking about that. They thought that that was the best precision rifle component, period. I'm talking about innovation, guys. I'm talking about new ideas, thinking outside the box, stuff like that. Uh, best custom rifle in terms of like, man, that is one wiggly, goofy thing, isn't it? I think it's a chair here. Or is it the floor? I don't know what I'm doing. I'm wiggling the camera. I uh, got the best rifle uh, in terms of custom rifles, spared no expense. So just like whatever, the, like the best suggestion I have. Um, the best factory rifle, um, like tactical rifles, uh, spared no expense. Like, so like we might spend a little bit more on that. And then we have the best budget rifle build. That's what a lot of you guys are going to dig. And it's actually one that I would probably grab if I had to run out the door in a hurry. Uh, the best value in new precision tactical rifle optics. The best value in new precision hunting rifle optics. The best value in a new carbine combat optic. And then we're going to talk about the uh, best value in a tactical spotting scope. And the best ELR specific product for 2018. And the best in peripheral equipment innovation. Okay. That's another one of them, thinking outside the box categories. There's a lot of peripheral equipment uh, that they were kind of redesigning that's kind of within the parameters that have been established and traditional for a long time. But I'm talking about totally thinking outside the box. Uh, stuff that's never really been uh, executed or done before. And so that'll be interesting. We're going to talk about uh, ballistic solvers, the best laser, the best book specifically for long range like uh, military uh, sniper book. A lot of guys ask me all the time, what's the best like book to learn all the comprehensive stuff, including field craft? And so I'm going to give you my uh, best book that I found there. And then there's the best uh, precision rifle related online training courses. Now, of course, we did the Sniper 101 series back uh, years ago, but we're talking about like a formal online training course. Uh, that you can take online. And it's not one of mine. It's not one of mine, but uh, I'm going to give you the, my, the, one, the best one I've seen thus far this year. And then we're going to talk about the best in commercial firearms training courses in general. The one where I learned the most, the one where I was most challenged psychologically or, you know, whatever. Or uh, in terms of, again, I, I'm a, I like learning new things. And being uncomfortable and, and going outside my comfort zone is some place where I really find that I actually learn a lot of stuff. So I'm going to share a little bit there. And then, of course, the best Rex defense class of 2018. So we're going to start at the bottom of the list where we just left off talking. And then we're going to work our way up towards the best, you know, rifles and the best precision rifle component innovation at the last. We'll save the, the best for last. We'll start off with um, the end of the list, though, the Rex defense course. So the best Rex defense course, man, that we did for 2018, in my opinion, that I that I enjoyed, where the rubber met the road for me, where I thought that this is real world stuff, this is what I think maybe communicated the most valuable information in terms of usability in the field that we provided was the Combat Command Fire course. Uh, we did that in West Texas. 
uh, in a little town. There's well, there's a little town there called Rotan. It's kind of like right close to the rattlesnake capital of the world. And uh, there's a, a ranch out there, a nice outfit called, called Hawks Double Mountain Ranch. A uh, big, big ranch, all very secure location. You can do some radical stuff out there. Uh, they have a lot of hunting and stuff like that, but we uh, did that. It's a, a combat command fire course. And so we got guys, and it's a field craft course. It's a, well, they got to go through an actual scenario. And they got to approach us. We're sitting on a fob, right? And we got a little target set up on the side. And they got to approach us, and they got to, you know, be sneaky. And if we spot them or bust them, we got drones. We got all kinds of little fun things that we had. And uh, uh, guys learn a heck of a lot when going through multiple stocks. Uh, that's something that we all envision in our brain that would be really cool to do. And we all have this idea, like we buy this equipment, like this camouflage or a ghillie suit or, or a certain bag or a certain drag bag or whatever. And in our brains, we have a certain way we'd imagine that we work in the field. Unfortunately, unless you know a bunch of really weird people similar to you or us, <laughs> it's kind of hard to play that game, right? Because you need to find other guys to sneak up on. So at this course, we provide that opportunity, but we also provide... Um, you know, training. We do stop, uh, spot reports and we do uh, all kinds of different uh, communications lessons and stuff like that. And uh, there's a lot of stuff that I can't say that we do in the course until you come to it. Uh, but the guys that came had a heck of a lot of fun on that one. That was my favorite one of 2018 was the, the Combat Command Fire course. It was so much fun, in fact, that we're actually going to do it again. And I think we're only going to do two of them uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, the next one is coming out in the spring here. And if you go on RexDefense.com, you can check it out. And then there's one in the fall. Um, but uh, that is a lot of fun. The Combat Command Fire course. And um, the, they're, for the guys that graduated the last one from last year, uh, you take the level two in tandem with the new guys that are coming in on level one. What you're going to do is you're going to shadow the training cadre and watch what we're doing on our end, setting up the scenarios uh, spotting for guys coming in, um, the way we think, the way we uh, approach a situation, um, how we try to exercise thinking outside the box, really the mind game involved there because that's like hide and go seek for adult men and it's a heck of a lot of fun. So for those of you that uh, want to learn more who have taken it already, uh, if you take the level two course, which is available right now um, on the website deal there, you'll be shadowing us and we'll be going through the same scenario uh, but you'll be on the other end of the deal. You'll be on uh, with us, and, you'll be, and we'll be having a lot more time to sit down the whole time we're visiting about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And so I think that'll be fun. So that was the best Rex Defense course of 2018. All right, we're moving on to new and better things now, guys. The best value in a commercial firearms training course other than my own, right? Because I think mine are the, the most fun. We That's definitely one thing we do excel in is a lot of fun. And of course, we know what we're doing. For the most part, we have got a lot of experience. We've been crawling around in the in the bushes since we we're all little kids. All of us training guys, we got professionals and everything like that too, right? But the best value in commercial firearms training that I took, where I was a student, was actually the fighting pistol class uh, with tactical response. And I don't say that because they sh show you a huge amount about like marksmanship with the pistol, although they do show you proper grip and draw and stuff like that, and they do get you to you know tighten it up and all that. That's not really what it's about, though. Fighting with the pistol is way different than marksmanship with the pistol. And uh, the mindset delivery, I thought, was excellent. Now, a lot of guys might not agree with that deal. Um, uh, Mr. Yeager has a reputation for rubbing people the wrong way. Certain kinds of people, I didn't get rubbed. No, I'm a nice guy. But I took the course, and I was not rubbed the wrong way at all. I found it very highly valuable. He gave a, a very good speech, the, the same speech that a lot of young guys probably got from their pa, like I did when I was a kid, about dealing with bullies or dealing with bad situations or how to stay out of trouble in the first place. And if you do get cornered in trouble, then what do you do? What's your mindset? And I think that that's highly valuable. Um, and I thought that that was a really, really good part of the course. Uh, something that I heard from my old man, obviously, and uncles and mentors throughout time and history, right? Uh, but I thought that his angle on it was really, really motivating. Also, there are drills there that are really interesting. Uh, the course is set up in a very intelligent way to really, I don't want to give it away, to really um, make it come outside your box and realize stuff about yourself that you didn't even know was there. So the, the problems that will get you killed in a gunfight are the ones you don't even know are there. 
because those are the ones you never worked on yet because you don't know the problem is there, right? Um, and so it's kind of nice to be able to have a collection of experience of other guys who, you know, it's that's why the warrior guys all get together and have their visits and they, you know, they sit around the brewski and, and, and talk about that stuff. Uh, so I thought that was an interesting course and uh, the best value that I saw that I took this last year. Uh, the best precision rifle related online training courses. Actually, I don't know, I think I uh, reviewed one of their books and I've got one of their books on the table because uh, they have books and they have stuff on Kindle and they have stuff online. They have like online classes too, but it's uh, Teach Me Interactive. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that outfit, um, but they have a plethora of different educational materials in more of a formal fashion. If you guys dig the Snack for 101, it'll cover a lot of that same ground, but from uh, they have like better animations than my anima animations where I have like with a, the cartoon, you know, the, what do you call it, Microsoft Paint or whatever. And uh, they do a good job going through it in a very thorough, logical, kind of squared away way. Uh, they also get real specific if you're in, if a lot of guys ask about reloading questions in detail. And that's one of the places, uh, there's uh, good sources on, on YouTube, of course, for learning about reloading. But um, to start from beginning and not miss any steps and get all the way to the end is crucially important when you're putting ammunition together. That's really important. And so uh, they did collect some experts uh, in the field of reloading. And I think that it's one of the better online places, Teach Me Interactive, where you can actually get together with uh, some experts and go through an actual course on the deal. And it's pretty affordable. And uh, let's see if I can I put it on my phone here so I can show you guys. Uh, so if you go to the website on the Teach Me Interactive, you can go to their courses page. And let's see if I can go here. Probably have a crazy text pop up on here. They got all kinds of different package deals um, and stuff like that and different training packages. And they do, uh, you know, rifle equipment. They go a very comprehensive approach on what kind of rifle to buy. Uh, so if you're, if you're just starting and you want to go through kind of a, a formal approach, that's a good place to go. So you can check it out. And I think what I arranged for you guys a while back, if you use the Rex code, I think it's Rex2019, you can get like 10% off any of their courses. And you got to go to courses.teachmeinteractive.com, uh, I believe, is what it is. And so if you find that deal on there, and I'll throw, for all this stuff, guys, I'll throw in the commentaries my best attempt at where to find all the stuff I'm going to show you today, okay? So that, I thought, was a cool place, especially for reloading and for formal firearms training in terms of precision rifle shooting. It's a nice deal, and um, they're very comprehensive in their approach, Okay. Uh, so that was the best precision rifle related online training courses. If you're just going to want to do it online, um, the best book specific for like tactical field applications that I found. And this is a good book too. I'm not saying the book ain't good, but specifically the sniper craft. This book is awesome. I don't know if you guys have seen this. I didn't even know that he wrote a book. This is my compadre, uh, Mr. Eduardo von Cuberta. And uh, he has 100 plus sniper exercises. And it's really actually pretty good reading. And one of my uh, old recommendations from back in the day from, I believe it was Paladin Press actually, was the Hard Target Interdiction Manual by Dean Michaelis, which is a really comprehensive uh, piece of work as well. This has some stuff in that same general category, but more well-rounded for small arms in general. And uh, sniper field craft and... Uh, it, it, it takes a consolidation of a lot of wisdom from a lot of different outfits um, because everyone learns something from everyone, right? Including me and even guys like Eduardo have been doing this a long time. The reason they get so darn smart on this stuff is because they're talking to cool guys. Eduardo was taught by Carlos Hathcock and Plaster and all kinds of cool guys like that. And so um, I learned stuff from Eduardo and um, everybody else and we all learn from each other. So I think that it's good to diversify your learning, man. And not only do like online training and stuff like that and get the books like uh, Teach Me Interactive, but you can get books like this. And to my knowledge, man, on Amazon, this book is like hundreds of dollars, like 300, 400, 500, 600 dollars some of them are going for. I found this hidden in plain sight on Steyr's website. <laughs> you know, like the Steyr Rifles. Uh, Eduardo does the Steyr Academy there. And that was like $34. <laughs> so you probably want to grab one before they're gone. Because I think, I don't know if Paladin Press is not in business anymore. 
But uh, you can get an actual copy, and this one is autographed too. I think Steyer. Yeah, see, it's actual. I got the autograph version, man. One shot, one kill. Really good read, though. I mean, there's a lot. There's so much in here I would want, want to go over and explain, but just like all kinds of good illustrations, charts, Morse code, uh, like comparing like SWAT units, uh, fields of ex expertise against like regular army, against special forces against uh, competition shooters and where their weaknesses are and where their strengths are and just all kinds of really good perspectives like patience drills where you lay down and just stare there and you have to wait for like an hour and the target will only pop up for a few seconds and I'm just I'm giving you a little bit away but it's a really cool read you guys gotta check that seriously definitely good reading and if anyone was wondering where I learned my stuff I learned it from guys like that you know uh, my mentor was very much in that same ballpark um, back when I first started doing this angle of rifle shooting. And so I come at it from the same general perspective, and I'll tell you, that's a good read. All right. And likewise with the Teach Me Interactive in terms of reloading, like I remember when I started reloading, it was kind of just like a little bit hazardous because I read the manual and I read the instructions on the RCBS dice. But um, if I would have had someone take me through step by step, I would have had a more harmonious outcome. Get it? Harmonious? <laughs> Harmonics, rifle, right? You guys get what I'm saying. Yes, the most entertain entertaining review channel there is. All right, what are we up next here? Okay, that was the best uh, training. Now we're going to talk about actual equipment, which is what a lot of guys are probably interested in, right? The best laser rangefinder that I saw this year, I just saw, you guys probably saw the review, and we've re reviewed a lot of cool stuff too, by the way, and I always see some top-notch stuff, but in terms of value, like the little loophole RX2800 comes in a little box like this, and we just did a review, you guys ain't going to beat a dead horse, but this little guy is like 500 bucks, and I, if you hold the button down and just scan around, standing offhand, you're like good out to like 22, 23, 2500 yards, no problem, like just pointing at bushes, cliffs, rocks. Um, grass, like just the hillside, shaded, unshaded. If you're scanning, you get a very, very good idea of what the heck's going on. Really cool. And we're getting readings out to almost 3,000 yards with this. Um, really good deal. So I would say this wins the competition uh, in terms of uh, value for this year of stuff that I've seen in terms of performance. Incredible. Not to say the other stuff I've seen isn't incredible. And actually, I just was talking to... Uh, outfit today that has some stuff that's going to be nipping at the heels of this deal <laughs> that is what i'm hearing and so the laser uh range finding market when you talk about uh the digital technology and uh the electronics it's coming a long ways in the last year or two um they're starting to figure it out because the market pressure is now there for elr and for guys that are shooting like you know with the 65 creek a lot of guys are shooting 1400 now and if your laser ain't reaching that far guys get grouchy and so that market pressure has really got, they've caught up with the market pressure and it's come down in price. And so like, I'm really excited to see what they come out with here very soon in the near future, uh, stuff similar to that from other competitors where it can integrate in with some other things and just a really, really cool whole field that, that I'm very happy to see um, flowering and uh, what do you call it? What do you call it, Ben? I was trying to think of some fancy word, I don't remember. But a field that I like to see doing very well uh, in the industry. That's awesome. And that was a really good la uh, laser rangefinder. Uh, ballistic solvers, again, you guys probably just seen this. But in terms of like field, like if I'm going to run out the door and need one, the Garmin 701 is really heavy duty. And in terms of me personally, usually what I, I don't like, there, there might be other stuff out there that has more features, like in terms of atmospheric stuff like that or whatever. You can link this in with Bluetooth to, to, uh, thermometer. But I always break stuff like this, guaranteed. This I did not break yet. And it, you can attach it to your wrist. You can attach it to your ankle, like an ankle bracelet kind of deal. <laughs> I actually throw it on the, the rifle itself. Uh, sometimes they can just come over and hit the buttons and stuff like that. Uh, they make little attachments and adapters for this. You can like attach it to your actual weapon, little brackets and stuff that can mount it in. But this thing is built like a tank. So go watch the review on the Garmin 701 Fortrex. This uses the Applied Ballistics Elite, which is actually... Now here's the thing with uh, any unit like this. 
guys argue all day long, like which ballistics program is the better one. In my opinion, like all of them like can do a good job if you, if you know what you're doing. Um, but b applied ballistics elite gives you enough of the tools. And this is what the professionals use. This is what your m soldiers are using right now, your tier one guys. And so it's a pretty good flexible program. And the trick is you gotta know, you can't just slot through the inputs. You have to actually look at what you're doing. You have to understand the concepts so that when you put in those inputs, you get good valid scientific data that's not skewed by some kind of uh, breach in field laboratory procedure, if you will. And that's something that requires a little bit of experience. And so that's just something that you have to read the manual, be very careful, think about what you're doing. You can take a training class from them or from us. We teach the basic uh, science, we teach that stuff. They teach a really good job on the, the technology and how to run it effectively and what the inputs mean and all that stuff. Um, so it's only as smart as you are driving it. But I like the rugged part. That's cool. And also this can Bluetooth to other things coming around the corner soon to a city near you. Near you. Soon to be seen next year, this year, I guess. We're in the year 2019 already, aren't we? All right, so that was that deal. The best in peripheral equipment innovation. Um, when this concept already came out, you guys have seen this before too, I think. But when this concept already came out, it was a really good concept, but it was executed in a way that was kind of a concept proving deal. This one actually is built to uh, mil spec standards. This is actually issued with some outfits. This is the TAC 3 by Accuracy Solutions. And this steel is a bipod extension. They thicken up the carbon fiber tube tremendously, and it simply extends your, your base. So you got your uh, bipod out in front of your rifle front. You guys have seen the original review was showing the, the prototype model, and the tackle on it wasn't near as good as this one. This one's actually ready for field use now. And so it's like incredibly tight. And so I think in terms of innovation, thinking outside the box, they finally nailed it. There's actually some really cool new stuff coming out, and I ain't gonna say it ain't shot show yet. We'll let them get the shot show, but even better than this. <laughs> they're, 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 they understand the issue with footprint, which is one of the issues, and so they got some new stuff coming out now. This is cool because you can use it on any existing platform, and you can use whatever your preferred chassis is. You just attach it on there, and it clamps down on a stain A rail, and then you can put your bike. I like to use. Um, this is actually my favorite bipod of 2018 actually is this. If you got a good sturdy bipod, this is the AccuTac. And they're kind of in that, they're more than a Harris. I don't think they're quite as much as an Atlas or kind of in that range of an Atlas. Uh, this is, uh, they make a whole different array of these things. They make them from way smaller than this to wide ones. And then they have like an F-class one, which is really wide. But what I like about them is if you look at the gears here, it's built like a tank. And you can modulate this, any articulate it any way you want. With the legs, you can straddle logs. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff with it. And you can get the spiky feet. I like the rubber feet a little better for what I'm doing usually. Um, but when you clamp the sucker down, it, it goes in tandem really good with that last product that I just showed you. But this is my favorite bipod, which I'll throw in as bonus points for 2019. I actually got this also from the same outfit that sells was they sell these two accuracy solutions if you're curious about where to find it but this thing is nice it's uh when you tighten it down here it's built like a tank so you can swivel but it's not loosey-goosey man and when you come to the classes and when we show you our firing system which is what we get into some of the details in terms of marksmanship techniques that are modulated to accomplish whatever specific deal you're trying to do uh particularly in elr shooting uh, there are certain things that become huge advantages, like not losing sight of your target under recoil. All of a sudden, you having a sturdy bipod is very helpful, and having the ability to lock it down tight is even more helpful. And then if you lay down properly behind the rifle in such a way to where your center of mass is behind the rifle's access to the bore, you can do very, very darn well. Um, and, and look at these legs, man. Well, I mean, this is cool. This is a beast. Like, I'm not ever going to buy any more Harris's. Harris's are nice. I'll probably buy them. I got the S-Series Harris is what I've typically told people to kind of go for. But the AccuTac, I mean, people just say it's heavy. Well, that's awesome. I like stuff that's heavy. Quit complaining about heavy stuff, man. You could 
you could like kill the deer with this or the bad guy or whatever you're trying to do. I mean, it's in, especially the spiky one. Like uh, if you do the three stooges stuff, poke up in the eyeballs. Then the wife. I'm trying to be a comedian here. Sorry. I'm trying to get her to giggle. All right. Back on target, guys. So that's the best in peripheral equipment innovation. Okay, there's a lot of other peripheral equipment that some of you guys might have seen. If you've come, if you've been coming to the RX seminars, we do invite guys that are like not on the radar to come to those. And I'm excited because this year, man, you're gonna start seeing some stuff that's gonna be released to the public for the first time. Those of you that made it to the seminar in Las Vegas got to know what I was talking about there um, in terms of equipment. Uh, that's being used by our Tier 1 military guys. Uh, stuff that's never been on the commercial market because the commercial market uh, pressure is different than the military market pressure. And I think that uh, they, they've come to a point now to where they're ready to release some of that stuff. There's certain periods of time on projects like some of those projects where they're not allowed to release certain concepts or ideas because they want our guys to have it. Um, but um, I'll be very excited to share that with you in 2019. Those of you met the gentleman who uh, I'm referred to in his outfit there at the RX seminar in Las Vegas, just like last month. And um, don't, don't tell anybody what we're talking about until I release it, because they got a time release situation. You guys were in on the inside knowledge. Okay, but uh, I'm excited to share that stuff pretty soon. Uh, best ELR specific product reviewed in 2018. I'm excited about this one. This one is cool. And there's actually, I'm going to be doing the full review on this. You guys have seen me play in with this thing for a while, but I never really sat down and explained what the heck it actually is or what the point of it really is. I did a little demo just, you know, shooting with it, like teasers and stuff like that. Um, why don't you give me the whole box, babe? Here's one there. Thank you very much. It'll come in your uh, box like this, your Pelican case. But we're talking about the TACCOM HQ. I took this to Tennessee for a class, and the guys are giggling because they think it looks like kind of like an R2-D2 kind of situation. You put on, and this clips on the front of your right, rifle optic, and we'll show you that in a minute here, um, with uh, really heavy-duty magnets that self-centers on these uh, deals here. But this is basically a periscope, okay? So this goes on the objective lens of your scope. There's mirrors in here, and they're simply situated. One of them is right here. I'm looking at it now, and the other one is right here. So your light goes like this, hits there, bounces up, and then goes like this. And so looking at the front of the scope, it's a little bit higher than average. But if you look at it from the side here, see this deal that turns? If you loosen up these screws and turn it, you're actually turning the mirror right there. Can you guys see that mirror? So when you turn this deal, you're just tilting that mirror up and down. And what you can do is you can add or subtract if you theoretically wanted to get subtraction on your <laughs> adjustments. But uh, you can add any amount of elevation to your scope up to like uh, 300 mils or something crazy like that. So you can shoot farther than the rifle bullet will go, basically. Um, and uh, you just turn this, and there's a, we show you in a video how to set the adjustments. But it's a very simple device executed in a way that's done with precision. And so that's the hard part is getting it built right. Uh, to where it's engineered, to where it's consistently good. This is something that has kind of been off the radar for a long time, too. Um, this has been issued for a while. This isn't new to 2018. This has been issued prior to that um, to certain specialty outfits uh, that do ELR shooting in the combat world. So, like, this was kind of, I don't want to say top secret, but it kind of was on the low side of the radar for quite a while. Uh, it's heavy. It's built like a tank. And it's built for operators, if you want to call them that, right? Like uh, JTF-2, a lot of these high-speed outfits use it, is what I've been reading in uh, declassified news articles and things like that. Um, and uh, word around the campfire is this is what they used to, for that 2.2-mile shot in Mosul, like last year. I don't know if you guys remember me visiting about that just a little bit. Um, and the difficulties involved with shooting that far. And it... The, you guys don't understand how far 2.2 miles is. Even for a McMillan TAC-50, with all the bells and whistles, running one of these things, running proprietary ammunition with the drone spotting everything for you or whatever they're doing, right? And uh, you can read about this. There's some pretty good articles that came out of recent. I didn't want to say nothing until the articles came out. But um, now that the articles are out, I can talk about it. But our, our friends, our allies, and our guys are running this deal right here. And they have been for a while. 
And uh, it gives these guys a heck of a lot of potential to really, really get out there and cause trouble for the bad guys. And so 2.2 miles, man, this is how they dial it in. You snap this on the front of your scope, you instantaneously add whatever amount of mills you want to. And they're actually innovating right now, coming up with new models. Um, I ain't going to say what that is yet. <laughs> um, I'll let them uh, tell me when I have the green light to explain what some of those new models are. Pretty cool, though. So this is a beast. And I'll show this to you again in a second when we get the other rifle out here, which is set up for right now. So that's the TACCOM HQ, T-A-C-O-M HQ. And they make all kinds of other stuff too, guys. They don't just do that. And some of the nicest folks you'd ever meet, by the way. Not lying. And I like I like working with guys like that. They're cool. Um, so we, and, oh man, that's the video I was working on this morning, wasn't it? I, I actually got to tour the, the manufacturing facility and visit with the engineer who built and designed all that stuff. It's one, once in a while you meet a guy who it's just fun to talk to him because like I nerd out all the time on the like the intricate like patterns of uh, harmonic reverberations and imagine like what would happen if you could build this and like if you could deaden the vibe and there's just so much cool stuff in terms of har rifle harmonics and technology in general and optical accessories like that and uh, stuff that could be existing and this guy is there he definitely when he was talking. It was like music in my ears because I was like, wow, this guy is on the same page as like what I always thought they should make. And he was doing it and I didn't even know it. <laughs> so I'm very excited to share that with you too, guys. That'll be really cool. Some of the other projects are working on. So that was the best ELR specific product that I reviewed in 2018. And I think they're actually not horrible bad on the price. Like you should check them out. They're more affordable than you might think. Um, I mean, they're, they're not cheap, but they're definitely worth it because you can turn your scope into a completely different animal and it's infinitely adjustable in terms of all practicality, infinitely adjustable. All right. So, uh, we got that. Now I, the best value in a tactical spotting scope is another one we did not too long ago. And it was a hard choice between this one and a different one. There was a bush nail. Elite, I believe, is what it was. That that didn't come out yet. That's going to be coming out soon. But this is quite a bit cheaper. And actually, the optical quality was better. Believe it or not. Now, you have the trade-off of a kind of a big footprint. And it's a heavy unit. And it's in its little case now. It's in its uh, soft case. But this is the Sightmark Tactical Spotting Scope. Sightmark. That's what I said. Isn't that weird coming from me? The schnob of optics. But uh, it's got a first focal plane mill scale reticle, so you can go any power. It's a variable power 2 to 60 power. And um, the reticle's useful. It's just really cool. And it's like not, it's like under $1,000. So they, the market, again, just recently is starting to catch up, guys, for affordable, really good equipment that's not bad. And the glass on this ain't bad at all. Now, it's a big unit, 80 millimeter lens, of course. And so, you know, in terms of spotting scopes, the Asians have been doing actually a pretty good job on glass for a while. Um, that was something they even were catching up in the 90s on because of the sporting market. And so the Asians have always done a good job with that. And um, I'm just glad to see that they're now available with a reticle. Because when you're calling in precision rifle fire, you can't just say, eh, I was sorted to the left. That's not useful enough information to actually hit the target on the second shot. Um, I like to hear, you are 1.3 mils left. Oh, okay. <laughs> Bam, or hold off and correct fire. Easy money. So, pretty cool. That's the best value. Now, the best one that I've still used to date, and I can't say that I found anything better overall, is this bad boy. This is available, of course, from um, Valdata, and this is the Optolith. And this is a fixed power wide-angle eyepiece which is a 30 power fixed power, but it's very wide angle. And it's hard to explain what it looks like until you look through it, but they do a very good, very good job. And this is actually made in Germany. So this is German glass. I believe it is shot glass, high density, apochromatically corrected glass. For all you glass schnobs out there, like you put that next to a swirl, we run a lot of swirls. Those swirls are really, really nice. This is right there. Like, it's the same quality in terms of glass, but it has that feature of that eyepiece where it's a very usable wide-angle 
tactical reticle in there, so you can use it for precision rifle fire adjustment. Those are quite a bit more money than the sight mark, but really nice. Okay, I'm getting on a bunny rabbit trail again, guys. All right, that was the uh, spotting scopes. The best value in a new available carbine combat optics. There's a lot of stuff on the market that came out in the last year. This, I think, is the best value. Um, and we're talking AR-15s, SCARs, FALs, G3s, uh, stuff like that. Uh, carbine battle optic, which means you're not going to be cranking around on it. You're not going to be, um, you, you just need something where you can get your, your uh, firing solution instantaneously. And this is just my opinion. The best value is the Raptor, okay? The Primary Arms ACSS Raptor, one to six. And this is a first focal plane scope, one to six. This is actually pretty darn affordable. And you got all your usable information you're ever going to need for medium range target engagement instantaneously. You don't need a laser rangefinder because it's built into the reticle, right? So you can get the width of the target, 18 inch wide shoulders. You bracket that, that's how far it is. And it gives you the ballistic drop compensation for all your battlefield type ammo, right? Uh, this one's built for 5.56. is specifically set up for like a SS-109 or MA-55 type ammo. So you just bracket the target. You got your ballistic drop compensation set at an altitude of 2,000 feet, which is kind of a medium altitude, which is very usable information. Of course, if you go to a different elevation, you just adjust your turn a couple clicks and then you reset, very easy adjustments. The other thing that this has that other stuff doesn't have, now this is what people don't understand. A lot of people when they're shopping for a reticle, they look for something that looks cool, like a, you know, like, like the reticle on a TIE fighter or like the F-14 where you got all the little, all the, and they make that exact sound too when you're looking at them. <laughs> like, a, like a Hollywood reticle, right? This deal doesn't have more stuff in it than you need. This has your ballistic drive compensation, your ranging. It also has target leads for a running target, 8.6 miles an hour. That's the U.S. Marine Corps designated running speed for bad guys, okay? And it's pretty close. And this has your wind dots. Who else has the wind dots? I don't know who they are. But this is, I think, the best value, like bar none, easy money. Like if you got an AR-15 and you're wondering what kind of scope you want to buy and you don't got more than 500 bucks, obviously this one, in my opinion, you'd be crazy not to try one out. Just run normal ammo in it, like, uh, you know, for a 16 inch barrel, M855, and you are, a, this makes 600 meters like nothing. I'm not even lying. It's really easy to do that. If you're good at combat marksmanship, that's a different deal. That's a whole other topic for a different day, but combat marksmanship is way different than precision rifle marksmanship. They are different animals because there's different states of adrenaline. Your muscles and your brain will work differently under those circumstances, and the equipment is different. You got an AR-15 or an M4 or, a, you know, whatever they're running. There's a whole plethora of different platforms loosely in that category. The trigger setup and everything is different, so you can't manage that rifle the same. You can't do that thumb outside the pistol grip kind of shooting with a nine pound trigger or eight pound trigger. It ain't going to work. You got to, there's a whole different skill set involved there. And that's something that we're going to do in our DMR courses in the future for guys that want to learn the combat marksmanship skill set and also uh, the designated marksman uh, uh, associated, uh, associated skill sets, which I think will be very fun for those guys. Because honestly, I mean, like an AR-15 can do a lot, can cover so much of the ground. I remember like when I first started getting into long range shooting and I set up my first steel at like five or 600 yards or actually I didn't shoot at steel back in those days. It was like cans and, or prairie dogs or something like that. And I remember shooting 500 yards and thinking, holy Moses is that far. But I was shooting a big magnum. And this is when I was a kid, right? Um, but honestly now with the stuff we got available, man, like that's not even that far. <laughs> If you got the right equipment, and if, if, the big F, if you know how to manage your equipment, that's the big, the big gap, usually. Um, so, pretty cool, pretty darn cool scope. The ACSS Raptor 1 to 6 in terms of value. Now, if you got a little more cash, the 1 to 8 is the Platinum is a oh, way big step up in terms of quality. Same basic premise, just way nicer quality. In a 34 millimeter main tube in a Japanese scope. Uh, very nice as well. All right. 
All right, we're getting towards the fun stuff, guys. Here, we're going to pull out the firearms pretty soon, okay? Uh, that was the carbine optic. The best value. Hey, babe, would you be a, a, a sweetheart and grab me this rifle closest to you? Um, the best value in a precision hunting rifle optic. Different category, guys. Let's shift gears here. We're talking about American sportsmen up in the bush, you know, tracking down the elk up in the mountains or the deer, and they got to shoot the target. And, you know, a lot of guys think in terms of minutes of angle, and they like uh, second focal plane reticle because it stays fine, and they're not going to use the reticle for that stuff. They're just going to dial it in. In that case, this is surprisingly nice. The Zeiss Conquest V6, okay? Now, this is a 4 or 3 to 18 power, and um, it's actually got like a 30 millimeter main tube. And the tracking on it is DOBA, dead on balls accurate. I mean, like, we did the review on this not too long ago either. Um, the mechanisms in here, I actually had Zeiss call me up after I posted the review because I was curious on how it was possible that it would work because a lot of the conquests, to my understanding, back in the day were not of this same quality. Some of these, because there's a whole spectrum of different uh, options available and price ranges, right? But this particular one is all Wetzlar, Germany. So this is all actual German stuff. The mechanisms in here, the erectors, all that stuff is, is Wetzlar. And so I was like, okay, well that would explain why it moved exactly the amount that I adjusted it, which is very hard to do until recently. There's some outfits catching up, but this is the nicest hunting scope I've seen in a long time. And I put it in the category of a precision hunting scope. So, it, and it's not super heavy either. It's actually like nicely balanced out. Um, so you can go read the stats on this. I got this on Optics Planet actually, and uh, they got a lot of stuff there, but that if I was a hunter and you want a nice scope and you didn't want to get all crazy tactical type stuff going on, um, and you didn't want something with a ginormous footprint either, this is a really nice refined gentleman's optic you know, option for that kind of a, for that kind of deal. All right. So there's this Zeiss, okay? Um, and the best value, in my opinion, in a new precision tactical rifle optic, okay? Now we're shifting gears again, guys. We're coming out of the hunting world and we're coming back into the tactical world. Uh, particularly, we'll call it tactical style competition shooting where you need everything to be dialed in right. You're, you know, like PRS shooting, stuff like that. Um, or long range, you know, if you're shooting your steel or even if you're going out in the bush and, and gonna use it for hunting or tactical applications, whatever you're gonna do. And I was, this is like one of the biggest surprises I had all year, actually. Everyone told me for two years I need to check out Athlon Optics. And I thought, yeah, okay, whatever. Like, mm, not my cup of tea. I'm a Schmidt and Bender guy after all, right? And so finally I got a hold of one and I got a hold of this one first. And this is the Athlon Ares ETR. Okay. And the ETR, I believe, is the Elite Tactical Reticle. So we have a scope with a 34 millimeter main tube. We got mill turrets, mill uh, scale reticle in here. The ETR reticle, you can look it up. It's a Christmas tree style reticle. Christmas tree style, right? And then uh, we got the 4.5 to 30 power um, adjustments. It's got illuminated reticle, you know, parallax, all that kind of stuff. And the footprint and the proportions of the optic is conducive to good geometry in terms of not being super fussy in its focal length, which is a nice feature. I'm talking about the long skinny profile optics. That's a video I should actually make more officially. A really good friend of mine who's really smart, he's an engineer in this particular field, was expounding on the importance of the proportions of the scope not too long ago. And I learned a lot of stuff from this guy and from other guys like him. And so I think that that's something worth explaining. But this optic is uh, of the classic rifle scope proportions, which does make it mechanically easier to get dead on accurate. But the thing that I found crazy about this thing was it's a thousand bucks. It's made in China, okay? And when I went to click on it, it's got the same positivity of like a tier one German scope in terms of its feel. And um, now I've 
preached for a long time at the seminar classes that that doesn't really mean all that much because there are a lot of scopes where the clicking mechanism is separate than the internal adjustment screw, okay? And so it clicks nice, but the stupid thing ain't moving on the inside. That's something I've experienced on other optics before. This one does, and when I did the test, I used a box to bench precision targets where you have the mill test, you can come up and down, and you can do a box test if you want. I'm specifically looking for elevation and return to zero. This thing was dead on accurate. And if you don't believe me, you can watch the video. I uploaded from the field. I didn't even edit it. So it's all in one shot. I'm shooting, and then I just show the target. We walk up to it, and I'm like, well, holy Moses, look at that. It's like perfectly, exactly 0.0000% error on the tracking, which I thought was crazy. So I thought there was a conspiracy, actually, because if I was them guys, and who knows who they are, I don't know who these people are, right? If I was them, I would do something squirrely. So I actually did some a little bit of vetting. Uh, we cornered the engineering team, and we actually did get a meeting with the entire outfit of the guys who are on the design team, um, the guy who actually is the head of all the projects. And I asked, how in the heck did you make that happen from China? Because it's hard to even get that to happen geometrically. You know what I'm saying? And the story I figured out, I'm going to release that when I do the full comprehensive review of this line of optics. Uh, but in a nutshell, it's in the machining of the parts. The materials are not brass. It's stainless steel mechanisms on the Midas and up. And um, for a thousand bucks, man, that's crazy. And also the inspection of the exact dimensions of the threads. I'm not going to say exactly what they're doing. They do run every scope on a collimeter. Um, and I didn't believe them when they told me that. They went on a cell phone. I'm probably telling too much. And I'm like, dude, put me on a video phone call right now. And then they went back into the room where, the, uh, where there's a whole bunch of dudes and the one you know, they're running collimators back there. And so they have every single scope come off the boat. They put it on there and they check it to make sure it's good. There, there a lot of outfits don't do that. So they, I mean, it's a pretty good deal, man. Like you get like German style tracking that would normally cost three grand for a, in a scope that's a thousand bucks. That's pretty darn cool. I was actually impressed. And the glass is really good too. Like it's not bad glass at all. The reticle is designed nice. Um, it's not super thick or it's not super thin. It's just balanced out nice. They had a really good overall configuration of the rifle scope. So I think this is the best value. If you're getting into the game, like this is not going to do you wrong. Now, um, anything's made by a human, obviously, and I could break anything. I broke my Schmidt and Benders, both of them, twice. They're both right over here. Um, and they send them back and they fix them or whatever. So it's, it's just an object made by a human. So it's always possible you can have something happen, but I was pretty darn impressed. And uh, we got some other samples as well, and we've seen consistent performance with the entire line. I was surprised that that could even happen. And I'm not even lying. Pretty cool. All right. Sometimes I have to eat a little bit of crow and correct myself. I am a correctable person. I can be wrong from time to time. And that was one case where I was definitely like, had to adjust fire because I said, wow, apparently manufacturing technology can eventually catch up in other places because it did. So that's amazing to me. That's really cool, though, too, that stuff on the market can be available for so cheap that works that good. That's incredible. All right. Uh, the best budget rifle build of 2018 that we did on the channel. It'll be that last one, sweetheart. She sent you a helpful one. You don't want to see my, uh, here we go. The plumber situation going on the back side anyways, right? Thank you, babe. <laughs> this is cool. This was actually not super expensive to put together. You guys have seen this before. This is just a Remington 700 AAC that I got used from, I don't remember, some sporting goods store someplace, like on the used rack because and it was all full of rust and it was dented up and it had some hog stock on it or some kind of plastic stock. And I said, that ain't going to work. So I spent a little bit, you know, if you get a little bit of a upgrade on the stock, I got a Macmillan A5 at Macmillan Flage. I like this style of a cheek piece, the one piece uh, screw here. Um, I got the awesome tactical side knob attachment points. I'm being funny, guys. I'm trying to be entertaining. I can call it the proper name, but I don't want to. I got the Badger bottom metal. This is the, uh, and I like the, the trigger guard deal. See the mag here? This is a Accuracy International style mag here. And um, 
I think this is actually accurate, Meg. And you flip it down. I like this because when you're wearing gloves, right? See that big uh, release deal? When you're wearing gloves, you can just hit it. Now, all this stuff we have to articulate, I don't like going inside the trigger guard to remove a magazine. Just, uh, I don't know if it's superstition, but I like on a glove, you can just come forward, knock it out of there. Easy, PC, and you're set. And you can use a uh, mag, so that's the bottom metal. And like I said, it's uh, standard AAC configuration. I did have my man true the action and square up the threads and stuff like that and lap the bolt because, you know, if you got a part anyways, it's no problem. And then I got the, uh, I believe this is Badger. We got a Badger one-piece rail here, and this is a 30-minute scope kilt, I believe, from Badger. And we got the Badger rings on here. All that stuff I got from Optics Planet. This is the USMC rings here. And they're matched. They got the three in the uh, back and the two in the front. And they're really, really, really strong. And all steel. I'm an all steel kind of guy. It's heavy. Well, lift some weights, man. Drink some more coffee. Hello. And on top of this, oh, and I had, the reason I had to get the barrel out of there and I figure out the barrels out of there is because I had them actually uh, true up the muzzle uh, attachment deal. This is a quick release. Guys are saying, hey, Rex, you got like an SDN-6 on your precision rifle? Yeah, I do. Does it make it shoot less accurate? A little bit. Not all that bad. Still totally, totally combat effective to 800 meters. Guaranteed death for b bad aliens, uh, space aliens, particularly with the big heads. What do you call them? Or chupacabras? When the chupacabras are coming around. And so we got the AAC muzzle brake that I wanted trued up on here. Transitional ballistics is incredibly important when you're running a suppressor, especially. You know, everything has to be actually square. And so I had them true everything up. And then uh, I got this. This is the primary arms. Uh, this is kind of their medium model. This is a 3 to 18. So it's got the 30 millimeter main tube. It's a lot less of a footprint, footprint than the 6 to 30s. And this is the ACSS HUD DMR which is still my favorite of their reticles for this exact application. This is a, in this 7.62. It's a three-way, technically. I had them kiss the chamber just a little bit, too, and I said, hey, man, I want more of the European chamber specifications, right? Like a CIP chamber. And so we didn't have that exact setup, but you can get a little more room in the throat so that I can run combat ammo in here, like M80, that I find on the ground from wherever I'm at. India, South Africa, South America, whatever ammo that I find on the face of the earth, I want to be able to run in this rifle. And it should chamber with no problem. And so I'll sacrifice whatever magic powers you get from having it too tight for oh, reliability. Because this is the Red Dawn rifle. So this rifle actually didn't cost all that much to put together, man. Like, you know, compared to a tier one, you know, custom build like we're going to show you in a minute here, which is really nice. But this one is something totally within any working man's capacity to get put together. And in beat in a 308, I'll tell you what, man, you can hammer rounds for 100 years with this thing and you're not going to burn it out. I, I don't remember anyone burning out a 308 in all honesty. No, it can't happen. And if you shoot 20 or 30,000 rounds through it at a really high pace of fire, you can definitely make that happen. On machine guns or, you know, like an AR-10, you can burn them up real easily. But on a bolt rifle like this, it's going to last a long time. And uh, they're not super fussy either. And they got plenty of accuracy and the ammo is absolutely available, 100%. So I thought this was pretty cool. The best budget rifle we put together in 2018. Quite a setup, man. I'm excited to actually do the review on this and show you how it shoots because it is cool. All right, sweetheart. All right. The next deal we're going to talk about is the best factory rifle. That big, ugly one right there, babe. The best factory rifle, we're talking like a tier one factory configured out of the box, no screwing around. If you got plenty of money and you don't want to horse around with this deal and you want like a battle rifle, like a, we'll call it a sniper rifle, it's not politically correct, I like to avoid that term, but like a real actual sniper rifle. Um, the best one that I've seen thus far in this last year is the uh, Steyr. SSGOA A1. Now it's got a lot of stuff on here, guys, but I'm telling it's got like one thing about Steyr, you can might maybe see the uh, barrel in the light there. You see the contour as I turn it, it's kind of spiraled a little bit. 
that's a part of the hammer forging process that they kind of left in there for aesthetic value. But like the hammer forged barrels done by Steyr are incredible. Like that's one of their strong suits. They really do a good job on the barrels on these. Um, some outfits don't maybe understand hammer forging as well as the Europeans, in all honesty, particularly these guys. Uh, the muzzle brake's very effective, obviously. Uh, this is their own bipod that they got on there. And um, you can tighten that up on the bottom. There's a switch there. You have a lot of modularity with the rail system. You can put your VAS in front of your daytime optic. And actually, I got this deal set up. Where's my Charlie at? I'll show you guys a cool deal. You guys might have seen this. We're shooting this at kind of far the other day. <laughs> For a three weight anyways. Pretty darn far. But you can take your Charlie. Terak that we just showed you guys a minute ago. And this uh, is a Schmidt and Benner PM2 scope on here. And uh, you just, uh, it's magnets in the front there. You can see that? And it'll just grab it out of your hands. Um, now, I just added 20 mils because I have this adjusted for 20 mils. You turn these screws, you can adjust it to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100, 200 mils, however far you want to go. And it's just attached by magnets, and you do have screws you can attach it with. Uh, but as far as the rifle, we got the spur mount and the PM2, obviously. But this has got a cool magazine set up. For those of you who haven't seen this, there's actually two positions for the magazine. You see these two little knobs here? Okay, so this is really well thought out. And uh, my compadre, my, my good friend, Mr. Eduardo, I think, advised these guys on a lot of these features and got a lot of the bugs worked out of maybe other, you know, that are common in other systems. And this is a really nice setup. So this is a cool feature that I never would think to make. But a lot of guys like to single load, you know, around at a time. Well, if you already got a magazine in there full of ammo and it's all the way in, you're picking up rounds off the top of the magnet, right? You can work in your bolt and your magazine fed. Well, if you want to take a round out, now you need an incendiary round or a tracer or a specialty round, an AP round all of a sudden, or something different, like maybe more expanding round for certain situations tactically. You just pinch the mag and you drop it down to that little notch that I showed you. So now the mag's a little bit loose and it's hanging down, but it's still attached. Now the, the fully loaded magazine with the cartridges in it acts like just a single round. You just lay that round on top. Close the bolt, and it did not grab anything off that magazine. You don't get a double feed, but you're in single round mode. And you can work the bolt all day long. It will not pick rounds up out of this magazine. It'll just um, miss it. So you have single round mode. And then when you want to use the magazine again, you click it all the way in. Now you're grabbing rounds off. Very simple. Dust cover, which is something that's actually really nice. Those of you who have gotten your rifle dirty in the past have the dust, you know, uh, the dust cover uh, as an option. You know how valuable that could be. Uh, we got the fluted bolt design. And actually, I'm seeing a lot of crud on this one because I've been shooting it a lot. And so we got that. And it's a very smooth bolt. It's a four lug design. And uh, when we come out the comprehensive review of this rifle, I will go over all those details. And you got the pistol grip. The trigger is actually very nice. Um, this is kind of a cool feature here. The safety on the styre, if you haven't seen that before, is kind of cool. So big the bolt here, right? See how the bolt handle is kind of like sticking out? Now, if you want to transport this, you can actually lock the bolt in tighter. We're going to pull out the, the safety. You see what I did there? See how I pushed that down? So we're on fire. Now we're on safe. But now we're on turbo safe. Now I can lock the bolt down like so. Pretty cool, huh? And then when you want to go, you push in that little gray button right here on the safety. Push it in, and then you're right back in business. Really cool. Another feature is I have very rarely seen a folding stock that I actually think is going to be good in terms of internal ballistic uh, soundness. Um, any potential part that's connected to another part, particularly from the recoiling uh, lug of the action back to your shoulder, any kind of cumulative uh, tolerances you have here, are always a problem in terms of keeping it like a really good a solid tight design and throughout wear and everything like that you have problems typically with folding stocks now this is kind of a cool design I'm gonna see if I can show you how this works here it's so tight okay well there we go there we go this folding stock has a unique mechanism that's really slick the way it locks up and you can actually cam it in but when you lock it up, you can cam this down, and uh, there's a lever here that tightens it down. 
And uh, you have another thing that's a cheek piece here. You can dig this. See the numbers on the cheek piece there? You ever have someone else play with your rifle and borrow it for a minute and they got to adjust it because everyone's face is a different size, right? One of the keys to executing uh, good marksmanship techniques is to have your eyeball consistently behind there. It's called your sight picture deal, right? So a, a scope is still like a sight. You got to have your head aligned behind it uh, uniformly, just like you would with open sights. Um, and so this is something that you can actually have a reference point of exactly where it was indexed. And you can put a little, you can remember your number. And so that's pretty cool. Also, it has a monopod that doesn't suck because a lot of them do. And uh, this one comes out like this. You hit the button, it instantly deploys. And then you can uh, screw it in and out. And you have your micro adjustment down here. So you can micro adjust up and down, but you have your gross adjustment being this big uh, switch right here. And so you can just turn it like this and do it. So normally I'm not a fan of all that tackle being on a rifle, but this one is done properly. And uh, it was like the coolest over-the-counter rifle with all the stuff you'd ever need on it. That you don't have to buy all that stuff. Because a lot of guys like to piecemeal this stuff together. And I thought, wow, they like got every detail pretty darn nailed down. And they're a pretty penny for a Steyr SSG-08. But they do make the same basic action and barrel available in like a McMillan stock or in a Manor stock. And they're like two grand-ish, somewhere in that territory. So you get the same performance in a more simple stock. A lot of the deal here with this chassis is kind of what makes it a little more pricey because it's a really, really like a uh, high speed chassis, right? But um, if you want a more affordable option, you can check out those other ones too. And so if you like the, the, the way the barrels are put together and the actions are done, not a bad option. So there's the sneak preview on that deal. I wanted to make sure you guys saw that for sure. All right. We're almost towards the end of the list, guys. We're getting close. So the best custom rifle. Now we're talking American made custom rifle manufacturers where you call in, you tell them what barrel you want, you tell them what uh, you know, stuff you want to use, what stock you want to use, uh, all what like what twist rate you want, uh, what kind of muzzle brake you want on there. And uh, this one, it's this one right here. Yep. This is a really nice shooting rig. They're, again, a little bit, they're a premium price, but there's a reason for it, I found out when I took it out and used it. And just looking at the craftsmanship, too, I found out really quickly, like, from the details and from the proof is in the pudding, you always know when you actually shoot it that it's going to work. These guys hit it out of the park, and I got to take my hat off to them guys, for sure. This is the American Precision Arms. Rifle I had built up. This is on one of their, they have it kind of branded for themselves. They're the APA Action. They have their own actual uh, base that they use here. And they have their own rings, which are actually very repeatable. And we'll cover this when we do the comprehensive review now that we've shot this for a while. But these rings are very repeatable. They're an interesting design. I'll show you the geometry of just the rings, like how they got it pinching on in the direction that it's actually the surface is facing so that you can take it on and off and put it on and there's like no loss of any kind of zero. Really nice feature. Um, this is in a manor stock, which is actually a very nice stock. And one thing I thought was cool, and I'm just gonna throw this in there as another thing that I respect in the gun industry. Um, I went to a Guardian long range uh, rifle match not too long ago. A Guardian match is like that charity shoot and they give all the proceeds to Bethany Christian Services, right? which I think is awesome. So I was like, normally I don't go to like comp those rifle competition deals or whatever. I'm, I'm too busy with my other stuff. But that deal, I thought I got to see this because this is going to be cool. A lot of dudes showed up and a lot of, of the world record dudes showed up. Like the guys that are the top of their field, like the, the top F-class guy in the world. Some of the top sniper instructors in the world showed up this deal. And uh, it's a different atmosphere because everyone kind of, they don't have their game face on so super serious and they're having more fun because it's a charity event and they're just kind of sharing uh, the, the craft of new shooters, which I thought was cool. Um, but one thing that was cool at the end, and I didn't even realize this, McMillan stocks, uh, Brittany McMillan is very instrumental in putting all that together. And I like McMillan stocks. That's one of my favorites. I love McMillan stocks. But also, Matters also sponsored the event as well. They weren't 
bent out of shape that their competitor McMillan was also there. And so McMillan and Manners totally got together. They came together, man, for the Bethany Christian service. And I thought that was pretty damn cool. Like that's, that's some classy behavior right there. That's what I like to see myself. And so my hat's off to both Manners and McMillan. And in all reality, guys, they're both tier one stocks. They're really nice. And this, uh, the Manners has got really cool lines on it too. I just showed you the McMillan over there, which is one of my favorites, but this is very classy, a little bit different style. Uh, how it's put together, very, very refined. Um, on the American Precision Arms, they have their own uh, bottom metal. And you can see we're running the AI style chassis. And on the trigger guard, if you look carefully here, you see that little deal? See that right there? That's your release for your mag. So you drop out your mag like so, see? And this is chambered in a 260 Remington, right? And uh, I got I got two 65 Creedmoors. Those are a great cartridge as well. And I love my Creedmoors. I got a lot of brass for them and I shoot them all the time. But I really like the 260 as well. I said that was pretty cool. And so uh, this is a really good shooting rifle. You guys have seen the videos uh, where we're putting them all in exactly the same hole. I'm talking five shots every time in the same hole. And I'm grossly out of shooting shape. Like my neurology is screwed up. Like I can't, like I'm wiggling. I got all this like twitching in my neck. And I'm just laying down, trying my best to do my precision rifle marksmanship, and I'm just slamming them in there, like, 100% of the time the same, like, they're all touching, you know what I mean? So, the, consistently. And that was with the first uh, reloads, or actually the first loads that Mrs. Rex right here did. Uh, that was her first time to load precision ammo. I kind of told her the procedure. She helped me do it because she's got the, the tenacity, you know, and I'm always busy working on projects. So, she rolled them for me. And it wasn't even the load that they suggested. It was kind of a copy sort of the load, but I slapped, like I didn't use the BR2 primers. I used the cheap ones. I didn't use the exact powder. They said I used an equivalent. And the brass had not been fire formed or nothing like that. And it was still throwing them in all in the same hole all the time. Now the details you gotta do in order to have that kind of result is you gotta have your barrel threaded in your action perfectly. That's gotta be done exactly perfectly. And I'm talking like with attention to detail. Your chamber has to be cut with perfection. That can't be off a little bit or that never happens. You will not get those kind of results if they slough through it. So they must be using some good methodology in their machining. Um, attaching the muzzle brake. This is an APA, same outfit. By the way, guys, uh, the guys that do use the APA fat bastard muzzle brake, that's what this is actually called. This is the same, the, the, the outfit that built this rifle is APA and this is their muzzle brake. So this is the rifle that comes attached to them normally. And um, this is indexed nicely. Well, it's a self-indexing brake, but in terms of the alignment of the brake, that's super important for accuracy and um, getting everything aligned. And this thing shot incredibly well. Last year, uh, one of my favorite innovations was the Axial Precision Rifles out of Idaho. And they're still like, I mean, they're it, once they all go in the same hole, guys, it's kind of like, how is the one better than the other? You know what I mean? But uh, for this year, this is like the nicest custom rifle I've seen right here. This is incredibly nice. And uh, when you look at all the details, all the Cerakote and all the stuff they do, it's pretty nicely put together. And uh, the results speak for themselves. We're shooting water bottles at like, what was it? I don't remember, 1,000 yards or 1,100 yards or something like nothing. I missed the first shot, but the second two I nailed them, okay? <laughs> I had to get my wind call. But uh, yeah, we still got the magic, man. We still got the magic. And so this was pretty cool. I'm, I'm very, very happy to see how nicely this is put together. Uh, the action is very nice, nicely put together. And this has the Huber Concepts two-stage, mold reliable, my favorite trigger still. Uh, so this is the Huber two-stage trigger, uh, configured that the way I had on my original rifle that I originally got, which is something I got memorized in my brain that I think is very advantageous. And um, They got it uh, really nice. Nicely put together rifle in 260. You know, shooting 140 grain VLD Elite match. I think I forget. I got a big pile of bullets someplace downstairs. I don't remember. I shoot so much stuff. I forget what I'm even running. <laughs> but a very nice unit. Oh, thanks, babe. That's the exciting part. Hey guys, we are live, by the way. Thank you, sweetheart. We are 100% live. Which means that at any moment throughout this entire 84 minute broadcast, I could have totally screwed up and said something stupid. But we made it. We're still there. We got one more thing to cover. A lot of guys are scared to go live. Because, I don't know, I'm not scared of nothing, huh? Except uh, 
circus midgets. What? Is that okay? That's a Ren and Stimpy saying. I'm sorry. I know we're in the distant future and not allowed to say things like that. I'm sorry. I didn't even know. See, that's... I just broke it. I did something stupid live. Sorry, guys. <laughs> you guys watch Ren and Stimpy back when you were kids, man? I thought that was hilarious. All right. I'm going to go back on topic. Last one here. And this is something I actually don't have in-house to show you, but I am going to tell you about it because I am about to show you very soon because I do have footage that I'm editing right now as we speak. I was hoping to release it today. I just couldn't quite get there yet. Uh, the best in precision rifle component innovation was something I thought was crazy. Um, TACCOM HQ, the same outfit that does the uh, Charlie Tarak in it, they make barrels. And the engineer, uh, Mr. Baker, who's in charge of the TACCOM HQ down there, the, guy, the, the man behind the operation who uh, knows a lot about the engineering, put a lot of that stuff together. Uh, he was an engineer that specialized in harmonics. Now, in other forms of industry, harmonics are incredibly crucial to a system. For example, on a car engine, right? If you got a V8 and you got your harmonic dampener up on front of the crankcase and you don't get that thing balanced properly, that, in, that wear that's induced due to bad out of balance harmonics is gonna create a lot of extra wear and tear on the system. A lot of wear and tear on any vibrating mechanical system is induced or exacerbated by harmonic uh, reverberations because instead of parts smoothly operating in concert with each other, you got stuff chattering together and you got stuff fighting itself. And that's where a huge amount of the wear occurs mechanically. And when you're talking about harmonics, uh, I've been preaching about this for years. You guys remember way back in the Sniper 101 series, I did a couple videos talking about this topic. One was specifically called harmonics. We talk about the seminar a lot too. But if you look at a standard rifle barrel, there's only a certain amount of rigidity you can gain through adding weight before the barrel gets so darn heavy you can't carry the rifle. For example, if you have a rifle barrel that's like not even contoured, right? Like you don't contour it down, the sucker is undeployable. Um, not deplorable, but undeployable. It's just too, too massive. And so you get rigidity by increasing that outer uh, diameter of the barrel. That's the primary means of doing it. However, the problem occurs that a monolithic piece of metal has the reverberations transferred through it very easily. Like a solid like piece of, uh, like a solid rifle barrel with just the hole through the middle. And those uh, reverberations are going to go forward and backwards very easily because there's nothing there to interrupt that harmonic signature. So what they've invented down at TACCOM HQ is what they call structured barrels, which I was very curious to see when I walked in there. I had no idea they did that. And, uh, they'll, and I'll show you, and some of you guys have seen maybe some of the teasers I put on there, but they basically have, a, it's like engineered lumber. You know how like uh, on the new modern homes, they have like the, the rafters or the floor joists whatever you call them, the boards under the floor that hold the floor up. And they're like quite a bit wider, but there's way less wood in there. And you have all the little triangles, looking at, it's engineered lumber is what they call it. Well, just by using, taking advantage of geometry and engineering, they can have a very rigid piece of lumber that if you have the, uh, a board that was the same weight as that, that was not engineered, this other piece of uh, the engineered lumber is like multiple times more rigid and solid and less apt to flex than the other one. And what they're finding with the uh, structured barrels is that uh, with the amount of weight that the barrels are, they're very, very massive on the outside. But there's a lot of material removed from the inside in kind of a very unique, very smartly done way to where the harmonic reverberations that do exist in the system can't reverberate evenly through it. So it interrupts the harmonics in such a way that cancels it up. And you take all the all the vibration out of the barrel. And um, so you have a super lightweight barrel that's a very large outer diameter that's, in, that's engineered. There's holes drilled around the axis of the bore going this way. And then it's also machined on the outside. Uh, they thought of every detail, man. It's machined around the outside where you've got threads and those threads are interrupted. So the threads will go, then they'll stop. Then it'll resume for a second and then it'll stop. And then they'll go again for a while and they'll stop. And that's the finish on the outside. The idea there is that even harmonics can transfer along the surface of a smooth surface very easily. They resonate all the way to one end and come back. If you have an interrupted thread pattern on the outside deal, you kill the harmonics coming through that avenue. And then plus, 
Um, one of the interesting things about the structured barrel I saw too, and we're going to do this in the review I'm going to show, we're going to actually let them explain it, is that actually creates a positive and a negative pressure flow as the gun shoots. You create the, the flow of gas uh, when the bullet, you know, from the blast and then the bullet going down in the vacuum, you're sucking and pushing air through those vents and the gun stays incredibly cool, which is very interesting. Um, like when you read, when you, you can burn a, I think we're shooting a 375 shy tack or a 408. I don't remember when we do the video, we'll show you, but we're shooting some big magnums, a 300 normal magnum was one we shot. We had an AR 10 and a 260 Remington, um, uh, with a with structured barrel in it. And you can run any kind of ammunition in the barrel. We had all different kinds of ammo, different brands, totally different weights. Uh, one of them was in a 260 Remington, the AR 10 was. And we're running like 120s, 130-somethings, and 140s. And we're shooting at the target. And I had two of my other guys with me, the training cadre guys, to verify um, that we weren't crazy. Because I like to not just have a single test. I like to get more of a baseline. And so I had them shoot the rifle as well. And we're all putting all the same exact, all, all the different loads through the same hole. That's weird. That tells me that one of the reasons for shot deviation in between loads is not just a velocity difference, but it is that harmonic whiplash pattern, as the theory has always said. Now, until they have like super high speed photography, it's kind of hard to actually mathematically predict harmonic vibrations. But if you take their harmonic vibrations down to zero, um, what I found when we're looking at those barrels is that there's like nothing happening, it's totally dead. Like when you shoot a normal rifle, you don't notice, but there's a lot of chatter that happens in your cheek. And you'll feel it, the fatigue in your face after a certain amount of time if you shoot a lot of rifle rounds. This one's totally dead, so it pushes straight back. It's like shooting with a big integral suppressor on it. It's hard to explain. Um, it's just kind of a straight back push, a very clean push. There's no vibrations. And you can do a very simple test at 100 yards just shooting groups. And all the different ammunition are shooting the same hole. So I thought that was interesting. That's something we're going to share with you in the very near future is a structured barrel design. So in terms of innovation, actually at the King of Two Mile that occurred over this last year, I believe that that's what they came up with too, was the same conclusion. And they won the uh, innovation award at the King of Two Mile. So they actually, I mean, dude, like check this out. We even had one of the rifles, I forget what kind of chassis was on it. But the buttstock was like, because they had just like put it on in a hurry, because we we're like driving there earlier than they thought we were. And the buttstock was so loose, it was almost ready to fall off. And it was just like wiggling all over. Normally, for those of you who are experienced in this deal, if you shoot a rifle with a loose buttstock like that, you're not getting minute of angle. You're getting like this or this or this in terms of your group size very quickly due to a loose buttstock. That's very common. You're going to get like a foot size group. We see it all the time in the classes. I've done it a million times growing up since I was a little kid with all different kinds of two-piece rifle stock designs, things like that. And so we were shooting. I was I was shooting with one rifle. I think it was the 300 normal. And I was grouping in it. I was hoping for a one whole group, right? And it was kind of like, yeah, man, three or four of them would go in the same hole. And there'd be a flyer like half a minute off to the side or something. And I was like, man, what the heck is with this flyer? I thought my marksmanship sucked. And... Um, Eventually, we found out that the butt stock was totally loose. And it was like so perplexing because, like, the reason the, the butt stock being loose is so detrimental is because of the harmonic vibrations wiggling it different each time. So it's connecting with your shoulder in a different way. That as that recoil is transferring in your shoulder, that bullet's still being pushed. It's Newtonian physics. So as that bullet is still being propelled down the barrel, you still got recoil coming back in your shoulder and how that interfaces in the recoil dynamics against how this is either leaning this way or this way, can totally throw you off. And so that's why the heart, that's why that, that can be an issue when you have a loose, loose stock. But with that, the gun was still one hole in it for the most part and had a half inch or a half minute of angle or maybe a three quarter minute flyer once in a while with a totally loose butt stock. And when you tighten it up, it's all in the same hole. That's crazy. So they've killed the whole barrel whiplash issue. They've, they've completely killed it. And I think the barrels are eight times more rigid than a barrel of similar uh, weight that's not structured. So that's my list for 2018 of neat stuff that we saw. And uh, I thought that I would share that with you guys. 
So now we are here, and uh, we just finished up the list, and we're 80, 94 minutes into it, guys. How much longer do I go? I probably should feed the wife, huh? That's probably a problem. Hey, look, she left her orange juice on the table. I almost spilled it. Mmm. That's good. I like some orange juice. All right, guys. Any questions? Anything that you want to bring up or any other things you want to talk about? All right. We got how are you late to the party. You said there wasn't going to be maths. <laughs> we didn't do no math problems, man. What's up, Rex? Christmas brought me a Remington 700 AAC SD and a Hoag stock with a SWFA Fix 12. There you go, man. Learn how to shoot that sucker and you're set. You probably already do know how to shoot it, actually. I just tuned in. What barrel was that? What barrel was what? Oh, that was the TACCOM HQ structured barrel. Now, they use any barrel brand that you want, in my understanding. So if you prefer Lilja, Hart, or whatever, you know, like a Bartline or a Brux or a Broughton or a, you know, Krieger, they'll structure it for you. To my, and you'll have to contact them for exactly how that works. I'm, I'm just talking out loud right now out of my brain, so hopefully I'm not lying. <laughs> but uh, they, they do the, the structuring process in their machine shop there. All right, so we got this... Uh, Never posted it, but I love Tibor. Keep it up. Oh, that's awful sweet of you. Thank you very much. I love you guys, too. Tacos, what the heck? Updated 1,000 meter for $1,000 rifle build for 2019. Oh, updated 1,000 meter rifle build for 1,000 bucks? Yeah. I mean, you can do the Savage. Anything in a 6.5 Creedmoor over the counter in a Savage or a Tika is like a obvious win. That's a good way to get to 1,000 meters easily. For a thousand bucks runner and throw a throw a, a budget scope on there that works good and you're set all right what rex uh poop hit the fan choice of rifle if you rewind the video as soon as we unpost uh or as soon as we're done broadcasting i showed you my favorite budget rifle for the year the mcmillan uh oh man rambo's trying to get his head in that glass that i was just drinking out of sorry about that i was distracted by the cat again Tell you what, when I go live, people just don't know how scary that is. <laughs> what was I talking about? The McMillan rifle. Yeah, it's the McMillan 700 AAC rifle. He had his head in here. Yeah. He's pretty cute, isn't he? <laughs> Would you trust a PSA upper AR-15 for poop hit the fan? Man. Uh, there's a saying. Um... Yamamoto said it, and some other guy changed it a little bit. I'm going to go with the changed version. Uh, when someone invades America, they're going to find a broken down homemade AR-15 behind every plate of grass. <laughs> no, man, I'm just teasing you. I don't like to mix, it, mix and match parts so much as I used to. I play with so many different AR-15, like build your own configurations. Some of them work really good, but then a lot of times you find where something all of a sudden kind of is goofy. I've just kind of gotten to the point where I just like to get something over the counter that's all all matched together. Like a BCM is reliable. Midwest Industries is a really good outfit that's very patriotic, and they're on the same page as us in terms of their general outlook of the world. That's why I really like Midwest Industries. Um, Colt, a lot of guys hate Colt. I run Colts and all my defensive home rifles, man. That's what I run is a Colt or a Midwest Industries or a BCM. That's what I roll with. Because uh, there's a lot of details, and we're going to talk about that when we start. We're going we're to do some DMR classes here. Uh, they're scheduled for Pennsylvania is actually what we ended up doing on the final schedule. And that's for later this year. And um, we have a gentleman on the cadre who's uh, been to some high-speed armor classes, armors classes. There's a lot of details of those rifles you got to get right for them to be at their tip-top shape in terms of reliability. And so... Um, I've got a lot of ARs that I've put together over the years. Like I said, a lot of them work fine for most applications, but if my life depends on it, I'm going with a good quality, well-vetted brand that's factory done and factory inspected to all the tolerances because it's cumulative tolerance stacking. You got an upper, it's a little bit out of spec from the lower and they're not kind of like mated. Pro There's, there are details that cumulatively can hose you real bad. HK416, absolutely, that's another good one. FN, H, and BCM, yep, FN, Fabrique Nationale, absolutely, that's what 
They just went to Ganey one time when they put on camouflage and signed my name on paper is FM. And I said, hold that coat, strong boy. Hold that pony. I'm looking, I'm looking at the receiver and I'm like, it says FN on here. This is not even American. This is a copy of an American rifle. I mean, Fabric National does a good job. Out of, I think they're out of Belgium, right? Belgium does a good job making weapons, gosh darn it. But it was not a Colt. It was an FN. <laughs> but they said it was a Colt. No, sorry. Read the receiver, man. <laughs> oh, I love you guys. I'm glad you're still having fun here. All right. What's your cat? Your cat's name is Rambo? Question mark. Yes. And poor Rambo got fixed today. So he's having a rough time right now. I read the paperwork that came after I got him fixed. It says this will reduce reduce your cat's night prowling. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> night prowling. Reduce your cat's night prowling. Make your cat less excited about certain things. Like, huh? Not a bad, not a bad job to have done on your cat, I suppose. Rex best nine millimeter carbine. Ugh. I like the CZ Scorpion. You like in the pistol form. And then you can get the arm brace situation for it until they retroactively ban that next because they're going to change their mind on all these laws. Don't even get me on that path. See, once they start establishing a precedent that they can just uh, make stuff illegal that used to be totally fine, all of a sudden illegal, and then they tell you got to chop it in a million pieces, it's going to be funny. They're going to do that with that stuff next. I guarantee it. Well, I'm pretty sure that's their plan, man. So, but yeah, the CG uh, Scorpion Evo 3 is a really cool little unit. I really like that. That's really nicely put together. It shoots good. Um, if you're talking the actual real deal, I like the traditional Uzi. I am I. Them are awesome. You can really wrap them out of there, and they're very reliable. They're a simple system. I mean, there's a lot. The MP5s are nice if you get one that works good. And um, Yeah, man. Like a legitimate HK. Oh, yeah, poor kitty cat. FN makes the M4s for the U.S. Army. Yeah, I figured they still... You know, I had an A2. I'm like a dinosaur, so I had the M16A2. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, the FNs, man, that's what everyone that I saw was running. Um, and you see a Colt once in a while mixed in there. Rex, Les Paul or Strat? Les Paul. Obviously. Strat's good, too. It depends on what you're playing, man. Actually, I... It, it took me like 15 years of guitar playing before I, I got into the strats. And I'm, I'm indexing through the commentaries here, guys. That's, that's why the screen is wiggling. Piston or direct impingement? Uh, you know, in all honesty, man, uh, direct impingement's a reliable deal if executed properly and if maintained properly. If you keep it wet or if you keep the proper lubrication on there, um, it's going to be running pretty good. I run that super slippery stuff, that modern Spartan systems, because you can like treat it that one time and then it's still kind of slippery after the stuff is even leaked off. It's just, uh, it works pretty good. And then you can, but if, as long as you keep your weapon wet on a direct impingement, it's going to work fine. Uh, in my experience, I mean, even in cold weather and stuff like that, you can get them to run pretty darn good. Uh, sometimes when it gets super cold, like where I'm from, man, you can't run axle grease on them no more. You got to use like something really thin because they will freeze up when it's like 40 below. Have you ever heard anyone run in G3 uh, 308 in any of your classes? Uh, not yet, but when we do our DMR class, I expect to see some. Someone better have one. <laughs> They're a very good rifle. Absolutely. Oh, my daughter bought me two rescue cats, Smokey and the Bandit, Tabby and Black Cat Terrors. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Magazines are next. Oh, I'm sure, man. Hey, man, that's the way the world rolls, though. I ain't surprised. We all knew this We all knew this deal was going to go down, right? That's all right. I ain't worried about it. I love the HK MP5. Oh, yeah. Ballistic calculator help. I have a Night Force NSX 2 to 5 to 10 on a C or KAC SR25. So the Knight's Armament until there. Do you know if Applied Ballistics has software for that scope? Software for the scope. So that would be something that would be a long conversation. Uh, we cover a lot of that stuff in detail at the seminars, man, where we talk about how to put in your inputs for whatever you're running. It's kind of a universal input system. Like um, your scope is going to be set up in either mills or minutes of angle typically, right? 
And so it would, would that be in run? It depends on what loads you're using um, and uh, what your atmospheric conditions typically are. So your load dynamics in that rifle, how much velocity do you got in that particular system, which will vary from rifle to rifle. And even, even though you told me what model rifle it is, if you get a whole table of them rifles out there, or rifles out there, they'll vary a little bit in velocity. So for extreme long range shooting or real precise, real precise shooting, you're best to actually measure the velocity yourself with a chronograph and get that exact velocity, plug in all the inputs, and then that sucker will be dead on accurate. But there's no like direct, really, it's not the best way to do it is just kind of use the general assessments. You don't want to read the, the box of ammo and say, oh, this is, you know, so many feet a second or whatever. No, you want to check that because uh, your system will be unique from everything else, even in the same, even in the same rifle. DMR classes in Pennsylvania. Yeah, check out rexdefense.com, man. Uh, it should be posted on there and uh, check it out. Uh, you go under courses. And there's a drop down menu or you can just click on the courses page and you scroll down and you'll find the DMR classes. When you click on each one of them, it'll show you which class and where it's at and what the equipment list is and where it's, you know, all the fun stuff there. Um, so we're looking forward to that. I'm actually going to release some videos specific to that. Um, getting folks ready with some um, drills they can start ahead of time. Uh, kind, kind of getting squared away on their uh, combat marksmanship. Get a little bit of practice ahead of time. Because it is something that, you know, takes a little bit of time and, and, and learning to do. And a lot of folks might be a little bit out of comfort zone in some of the positions we'll show them how to shoot in. And so the key to unlocking your battlefield performance is going to be uh, combat marksmanship. Those ARs or any of those rifles are going to way outperform our ability to run them when the, when the situation happens. And so uh, mastering the marksmanship side of things is going to be the key. And that's what we're going to focus on. Um, when you're looking at the term designated marksman, marksman is the part that's like most focused on. You're designating not a rifle, but you're designating a guy who is a marksman using a rifle to aim at stuff effectively and hit. So that's the skill set that we're going to the transfer. I'm excited about it. It's going to be fun. And uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's so much. That I can't even tell you how cool it's going to be. Uh, we got a really, really good crew assembled. Um, it's going to be a really good operation. I'm thinking it'll be like the best one. <laughs> That's always my goal. Yeah, South Africa is about to have a civil war. Putin wants to take the Boras. Oh, oh man. The Boras, yep. I think there was a misspelling there. Oh, man. Our SWFA Super Sniper 10 to 42, still good quality. Uh, the ones I have work good. Casey Day has one that works good. Uh, some of the guys have been experiencing some problems. Um, so, I mean, things evolve over time. Um, uh, you'll have to check and see if yours is working good. I know they used to have really good quality control. Um, when I talked to them last, I know that they are working on that. So, um, I'm hopeful that uh, everything's going to work out pretty good with them guys. But just check yours. Um, because there's still nothing for 300 bucks that works like that. Um, in, if you're dialing, really. I mean, it's hard to find the scope of that kind of good dialing quality. So, yeah, you're just going to have to check your model and see if it works. All right. What do you think of the Ruger Precision Rifle, specifically the 338 Lapua? Huh. I haven't seen the Lapua version of the Ruger Precision Rifle yet. We'll have to see how that works out with the back end of the stock on there when you got a little more recoil. I'm curious to see how that would work. You guys will have to let me know. All right, I'm going to take two more questions and then I'm out of here, man. I got I to gotta take out the wife on a date. That's my plan. We're going to go right over there. <laughs> oh, man. Any plans for classes in Florida? I know you were here not too long ago at the Manatee Shooting Range. Not sure if it was for... Yep, that was a Rex Defense class. I would love to come back to Florida. Uh, just uh, kind of setting up the 2019 schedule here. We might be doing some other places too, man, like Georgia, maybe uh, North Carolina. Kind of looking at some of those... Uh, options there so stay tuned you can just continue to look at the rex defense website we are very close to actually having a map up which will show like where we're at and also a calendar just a list of when the class is in chronological order when and where they're going to be so that should make it a lot easier to navigate for you guys too one more question and god bless you rex that's a great question thank you i need it too i think we all do now 
Are you going to shot? Oh, man, I want to go to shot. I got lots of friends down there. I've been waiting to meet forever. Um, we're still, like, in the middle of a bunch of stuff, man, and we're just uh, working on logistics. If I can humanly possibly make it there, I already got all my credentials ready to rock and roll. I'm going to be a media guy or whatever the heck. And so I'll come down there and go to shot is my plan. I know I've been planning on it for the last six months, but life throws curveballs at you sometimes. So I'm not sure if I can make it totally. If I am there, I will be there. <laughs> and they'll spot me with my black shirt and my green hat. It was awesome hanging out with you guys. Thanks for watching the video. I always enjoy these live streams. Only God knows where they end up, but I think we did okay on this one. So we'll catch you guys on the flip side. As soon as I figure out how to turn this thing off. No, nope, that's not the right button. How about this button? Oh, the X of it, right? Aha. Uh -huh. All right, guys. You guys have a good weekend.